be residential like commercial are going to be single phase. And they're more likely going to be PSC. This was a draw that was really emphasized in the fact that we talked about identified terminals and run capacitors. If I had the identified terminal on the start side of the run capacitor, as long as it doesn't fail, it's going to work. But if I have this on the outer plate, it swells and touches the case and goes to the ground. Notice that overload current on the ground was to start winding right to the ground. So it would be getting 120 volts all the time. And I would burn up my start point. If I had put the identified terminal on this side and it went to ground, then L2 would have went, or L1, would have went right to ground. And the breaker would have tripped, the fuse would have blew, and we'd be done. And we'd come out and find a capacitor that's shorter than ground. So that's what the identified terminal is. But this was the picture I found of the PSC. Most are 6 horsepower or larger and are a 48 frame, like the general replacement motors you carry on your service van. We carried 2 quarters, 2 thirds, and a half, one half. We did likewise on blower motors. We carried a couple quarter, 120 volt, a quarter, a third, and one half, 120. And then we carried a third and a half and 208. It didn't cover them all, but that covered the majority that we ran into. Most have prop style fan blades. I have several pictures here. This one's mounted shaft down. The butt of the motor is mounted to the top of the unit. The shaft's facing down, the fan blade's on there. There's a variety of ways you can see how to do this. However, the motors are mounted in a variety of ways. The way the motor is mounted determines which type of motor, and particularly which type of motor enclosure is used by the manufacturer. When the motors are mounted horizontally, they should be fully enclosed, at least at the top. Some of the manufacturers will have vents at the very bottom. But when I reorient that motor, that replacement motor, there's a couple things to be in concern. One, I want the vents at the bottom, not at the top. And then also, I don't know if you can see these little yellow looking brown dots. That's the oil caps. Well, it's going to be hard to put oil in if you've mounted that with them down. So I'm going to have to take the time to loosen the motor and turn it around to oil it. So also pay attention to that. Now, those are plastic caps. That was the crap that started coming around in the mid-80s, late-80s. And they've gone back, as best I know, to the little aluminum caps. Because those would last, especially if they had direct sunlight, about four or five years. And then they deteriorated and you couldn't get them out anymore because they'd just break off if you tried to pull them out. And then you'd have a permanent plug in there unless you took the time to drill them out. But then you'd get all those little plastic shavings down your bearing. So then it's not going to be good. Are you actually supposed to put oil in there? Yes. Now, the motor manufacturer will usually tell you how much. But most of them, with sleep bearings, it's two drops every two years for air. That's all you need. If they didn't want you to oil them, then they don't put oil ports on them. But it's not something that you necessarily have to do every year. Now, what we did as a company, we chose to put a drop in them every year. But we only oiled the outdoor fan motors when we were in the spring, checking them, getting them ready for the summer. And we only oiled the indoor motors in the fall. And now, if somebody just went out and did a spring check this year, and the blower motor's bearings need oil, they would do that. Now, all of a sudden, we've got one that we have to oil the indoor blower motor in the spring, too, to keep them on track. But oftentimes, what we did there is we'd go ahead and put the two drops and then hit it again in two years in the fall. Does that make sense? Good question. Now, one of the things I'm doing here, this will make more sense in a minute, but I'm using a tape measure, and I'm marking a fan blade of its distance. And there's not any specific part on the fan blade that I've got to mark. But what I do is I would have put a black mark on that one fan blade. And then, you know, if I wanted it to be at exactly one inch, then I'd put my tape measure at one inch and then mark the fan blade. Otherwise, I'd just put a mark on the fan blade and measure that distance at an orifice at a specific spot. Because it might be that the motor mount is not perfectly in there, so the motor is kind of off just a little bit, so it's not the same distance all the way around exactly. Now, it shouldn't be way off. Don't get me wrong. But it may not be exactly. And one fan blade could be just slightly lower than the other. 
So I always wanted to mark the fan blade that I was going to check and mark it in a reference at some point and go back to that exact point, that exact fan blade, and check it again and make sure it's the exact same distance. Before I even start removing the fan, because otherwise how am I going to know where the fan blade is supposed to be? And just being in a little bit or out a little bit is going to change how much load I put on the motor and, more importantly, how much air flow I move across the board. So before you even attempt to start moving them, make you a mark. I'll show that here in a minute in all the different places how I mark them. This is another more horizontal than vertical. Well, it's kind of in between horizontal and vertical. It's a commercial piece of equipment. But again, they've got a rain guard because the shaft is up. Now that one is a 5-8 shaft and it comes with the motor. I don't know if you can get that, but a lot of our residentials, they don't come with a new fan blade. I mean a rain guard. It just slides down with the shaft before the fan blade is put on and it shields that bearing from moisture. It makes it run off the side of the motor. And they're really expensive. They're like little Frisbees. And I always carried the half inch on my truck because that was the most predominant size shaft that I saw. And so I just carried those. And we stocked them at our place. And so any time I run a motor, I go grab another four or five and throw them in my truck. And make sure you put one of those on. If you don't have a rain guard on your truck, when you pick up the motor and it mounts shot and shaft up, it's not going to more than likely be on the motor. You can open up the box and see if it's got a rain guard. But if it doesn't have a rain guard, ask for one. Because the motor is not going to last if it has constant moisture going down to the bearing. And that shields that. When the motor is mounted vertically with the shaft down, the lead in, the back of the motor, must be fully enclosed. Now, our general replacements, most of them are fully enclosed. And we had a cap that came in the back. We mentioned this when we were going over that nameplate information. If I was going to mount a shaft up, I need to pull that plug out of the bottom and put it in the hole at the top. And what that's there is not for rain to run out. We shouldn't have any rain in there. But condensation can occur at certain temperatures because of the temperature of the windings and the temperature of the outdoor ambient. And if we have condensation in there, we want it to be able to run out of the motor. The windings can handle a little bit of moisture, but they can't handle a bunch of buildup. Because they look like bare wire, but they've actually got insulation around them. Otherwise, they'd be touching each other and be a direct short. But we don't want moisture inside the motor. If it does get in there, we want it to have a place to escape. So you may be moving a plug from the lead in to the shaft in if you're mounting the shaft up. If you're mounting the shaft down, you just leave that plug in the butt end of it, the lead in, and leave the hole in the shaft in so that any moisture that's in the motor has a way to get out. There's a factory rain guard. My rain guards came on out here, and they spin with the shaft. So it's not that you push it all the way down as hard as you can, because then you're going to have a noise or some extra resistance for the motor to overcome. But it is slid down, and it covers up that end bell where the shaft comes out so no moisture gets down into the bearing. Warning, of course, all power supplies should be turned off and locked out. Now, one of the reasons this gave me an opportunity to talk to you guys is because we had just lost a technician in the industry about the time I made this. And he was a veteran of about 12, 13 years. He'd been in the industry 12, 13 years, and he left two young children, like four and three or something. And what he was doing was working on a commercial property that didn't have a disconnect at the unit. He had gone down and turned the breaker off. He was in the process of changing the motor when somebody goes, hmm, maybe this is why the air conditioning is not working, and turned the breaker on. He got shocked and fell into the motor and impaled him. So they're not really for sure whether the shock killed him or the impaling of the shaft. But because he was jerking hard, probably, that's why he went ahead and got impaled. But, you know, if you have a situation like that, if you don't have the appropriate lockouts, if nothing else, turn the breaker off, put your card over it, tape it off, and explain why it's off, that you're working on it, and then tape the disconnect all up, the breaker panel, tape it closed. Go up, tape the power off the unit. In other words, tape the leads off. And then when it comes time to put them back on, make sure you don't have power because you want to tape them. And you can check that one wire to ground, make sure there's no potential, put it in, screw it in, 
do the same with the next ones. But make sure power is all off before you start attempting to electrically unwire them or put it back on. It sounds obvious, but a lot of guys, they've done this a million times, they take shortcuts. And I told you a story about turning off a disconnect here in a clunk. Well, all three legs were bypassed. Okay? And it just so happened you didn't have to shut off just shortly after it, but it wasn't immediate. And I was like, hmm, that's weird. But I didn't check. It's crazy. I'm fortunate to be here. I'm fortunate to have all my fingers and all that because as soon as I got done adjusting the belt, the unit came on. Okay? And it was a big enough floor motor, it wouldn't have had no problem taking my fingers off. Okay? So, you know, always make sure. Don't assume anything. I was telling somebody the other day in lab, there was very few people in the industry that I trusted with my life. One or two. That, and one of them works for a grip right now. If Wes told me, if I asked him, is power off, I know he would have checked. He would have just turned off the disconnect and go, yeah, it's off. Because he was more concerned about my, my life than his own life. You know? And there was very few people that I would trust that way. Uh, if he told me power was off, I felt comfortable going ahead and getting in there. But I still touched it with the back of my hand first. But uh, most people, I mean, yeah, not that I didn't like them or anything like that. I just saw that they half-assed other stuff, and I didn't want them half-assing at that time and not really checking to see if power was off or not. When servicing uh, motors, they should be checked for bearing wear. We do this by checking the shaft. If we have any play side to side, that's bad. Okay, there shouldn't be any uh, play from side to side, but you have to grab the motor. Most of the time, this bracket will give some. So if you just start moving the shaft, the other shaft's going to move some. But when you have a bad bearing, you always feel the shaft look inside there. And move from side to side. You grab a hold of the motor uh, with one hand, the bottom of it, and move the shaft from side to side. Now there can be some play up and down. If it's real excessive, then the motor needs to be replaced too. But you can pull the shaft up slightly and push it back down slightly. Uh, the bearings are coming in and out of their seat, and that is expected that the weight of the rotor will hold it in place. But yeah, if you pull on it hard enough, you'll feel a little movement up and down, and that's normal. It also should turn free. Okay? Uh, for me, it was easy because I used to pack bearings on my uh, bicycle. I, I repack them on car bearings and all that, and you want it just tight enough to where there's no play, but it turns free. Okay? But in the past, I've tried to explain that to the students. You know, like when you repack your motor bearings, and they're all looking at me like they're looking at me, like the cat looks at me and gets what? Because you guys live in a throwaway world for the most part. When your bicycle wheel bearings failed, your mom and dad just watched you do bicycle or, or a new wheel. They didn't, they didn't tear them apart and repack them and chase all those little ball bearings all over the floor. Right? Um, but I did that as a kid. So I, uh, when you go out on internship, you let know, something. You may tell your journeyman, journeyman, I need bearing check 101. You know, they, they briefly talked about it, but nobody's really showed me how to properly check bearings. And you know, he'll probably say, oh, college boy and all that, but pay attention. You know, how he, and it's going to be kind of weird when you see him sitting there with his screwdriver up to his ear and he's turning a shaft. You can't help but try. Okay. But you really can hear a bearing growl. Okay through a uh, screwdriver. Uh, the other thing that we have today is we have the ability to use a, a non-contact temperature meter. Your, your uh, company will probably provide you one. Mainly we check disconnects and fuse connections and all that with But I can shoot that motor with it too. If I'm doing it all the time, I know what normal bearing temperature is. Uh, it used to be in uh, big uh, complexes, they had people that's that was their job every day, just to walk around with a clipboard and measure temperature bearings and write them down. Measure temperature bearings and write them down. And we kind of like the same people to do it. Now, if there was five degrees off between me and Jordan, they didn't really worry about it. My bearings are going to be five degrees warmer than his bearings. You know why? Because I'm that much closer to the bearing than he is. Those infrared non-contact, they get less accurate the further away I am. And he's a lot taller than I am, so you know, that extra foot or two feet closer to the bearing that I am, that he is, it's going to make a difference. But if we're recording bearings all the time, and all of a sudden when he does shift, his bearings are 25 degrees higher than normal, there's a problem. Okay. It could be an overloaded motor, but more than likely we've got bearing damage. 
Nowadays, they use harmonic sensors. We don't pay people to walk around. Johnson Control sells this a lot. They, they have harmonics, and, and a bearing that's going out makes a certain harmonic noise. A good bearing, of course, is a lot quieter. So they can know when a unit needs to be tore down. Uh, and they don't just do it periodically. They do it only when it needs to. Because they're, they're monitoring all this stuff on, on the, the equipment. And they know when it needs to be tore down and bearings need to be replaced. The shaft should turn freely without friction. It may be possible to oil the motor and get it to turn. However, it should still be condemned. Okay? This was the first thing that I remember I condemned that was wrong in the journeyman the next day when he was telling me, well, what did you find out there? Uh, he was going to be going to the call. They redirected him to something else. And he thought it was a fan motor by the description of the customer. So uh, he, he asked me, well, what did you find out there? I was what? Well, the bearings were bad on the fan motor. So you replaced it. No, I was able to oil them, get it turned and free it again. So I, I fixed it. Same with the money. You're an idiot. We'll be back today. What? Because the bearing damage is already done, you freaking idiot. Sure enough, they call back the next day, the fan motor and fry. Okay. If you're having to grease a bearing or oil a bearing to get it to turn, the damage is already done. Just change the motor. Okay. You're not going to fix it. When I say short time, mine lasted just a few hours. We'll go back out to the next day. Fan blades should be inspected for cracks, loose rivets, dents, and other defects. If I begin to see cracks form from these rivets, if I don't replace it, what's going to happen in a short time is that fan blade's going to come apart. And then it's going to get into the condenser coil and refit all the pieces and maybe require them to replace their old equipment when all it really needed was a fan blade when I inspected it. So pay attention to those fan blades and make sure you're not seeing cracks. And what I mean by loose rivets, when I grab a hold of this fan, it shouldn't have a lot of play off of its mount. Do you get that exact fan blade when you call them? I try. I try. try. And I never was real good at pitch, okay, figuring pitch. There's pitch gauges that you can buy. I usually took the fan blade with me and set it on the counter and said, I need one of those. Uh, it's going to make a big difference whether I go two blades or three blades, three blades versus four. So don't let somebody sell you on that. No, I can't go down in blades, and I'm going to unload the motor. But if I have more blades, I'm going to load up the motor. So I can't replace a three with a four or a two with a three um, unless I change the pitch, too. Now, they can crop for a certain set. They got them in the book. So if they've done that, you had a certain pitch, two blade, and now they uh, don't have quite as much pitch, but they have three blades that'll move just as much air. So if you got the same pitch, more blades, it's more load on the motor. You know, if one's dented, uh, you find this a lot on heat pumps, um, uh, especially heat pumps with gas backup, because at about uh, anywhere between 35 and 40 degrees above freezing, we shut off the heat pump and just go to gas backup. Now, if it's a heat pump electric backup, it runs no matter what the outdoor temperature is. It just keeps having coasters help it out. Okay? But in gas backup, there comes a time where there's doesn't make any sense to run the heat pump anymore because it can't keep up with the amount of heat that's escaping the house. Gas furnace can't. Well, what will happen is while it's off, if we're having sleet and rain, and it's, it's running off the roof, they don't have gutters, and it's pouring down the unit, and ice forms around the orifice that the fan blade turns in. And it'll actually freeze. I've seen it where the fan can't turn because it's just uh, ice between the fan blade and the orifice, and it can't overcome that ice. But sometimes there's just a little bit of ice built up, and you know what, normally we have a distance like this between the orifice and the fan blade, perhaps now it's down to that, and the, the fan blade keeps hitting the ice. Well, it breaks the ice, but it dents the fan blade all up. Okay. And anytime a fan blade is is uh, out of balance, the, it's going to wear the bearings fast. So if the bearings are still good on the motor, change the fan blade only now. Because if you don't change it now, you're going to be changing the motor because it's going to it's throwing a lot of weight at one point and it's going to flat spot a bearing. Um, the bearing's going to go out. So inspect your fan blades. And it'd be a lot better for you to change a fan blade this year than a fan blade and a motor at the end of this year or next year. Yes, How do you know if a fan blade is out of balance? You'll see it. For one, it'll shake the unit all in place. So you walk up, you're going to do that instead of just running smooth. And you can see the fan blade, it, it's moving as it's going around. Okay. Uh, is the motor an OEM motor? What's OEM stand for? Original manufacturer. Yeah, yeah, original equipment of the manufacturer. Is the fan blade okay? Does the motor need a rain guard? Is the equipment ordered in 10 years? Why is this a concern? 
different fan blades. Square and tear? Yeah. One, you've got an old fan motor, okay? Uh, it might be in the uh, best interest of the customer. Instead of putting uh, $250, $300 into this old unit to replace the fan motor where the contact is still old, the capacitors are still old, the compressor is old, the condenser is old, the whole system's old, it might be time for them to consider replacement, especially if it's general re uh, equipment that came with the house. Builder's grade, contractor's grade, pieces of crap, okay? Now, if they've got a good unit, and they have a 10-year warranty, that's another thing, is if it's ten, less than 10 years old, it very well may be under warranty. The customer shouldn't have to pay for the motor. Now, I can get the manufacturer's warranty, regardless of whether I'm a ring dealer or not. If it's ring and it's under warranty, I can get the warranty. I don't have to be a ring dealer to get the warranty, but I can't uh, warranty the labor. Whoever installed it warranties the labor. But at least I can get the part under warranty. So call the manufacturer if it's less than 10 years old, it very well may be under warranty. If it's over 10 years old, it's not going to be under warranty. That's the most uh, longest warranty I know on condenser fans. Now some of the compressors may have longer warranty, but usually 10 years is max. On a builder's grade, it's usually five years compressor, one year parts. So if it's builder's grade, it's probably out of warranty, but double check. You know, call the manufacturer and find out if the part is under warranty. If it's not, it's better for you to put your general replacement off the truck on it than to go to the manufacturer because they're going to charge a lot more for an OEM loan. Okay? But that's why I put that on there. To talk about, you know, consider it. And is it in their best interest to go ahead and replace just the fan motor, or would it be in their best interest to change the entire equipment? I struggled with this when I first started because to me, I was always trying to spend their money. What would I do? Well, I don't have $7,000 to replace the equipment, but I bet I could scrape together $300 to replace the fan motor. So I'm trying to spend their, their money. You'll be surprised at who will and who won't. The people that appear to have it, they're usually always just, just fix it, the fan motor. They don't want to replace the equipment. But yet other people, they're like, that makes sense to me. You know, they spend their money wisely, and they know that investing in a new system is a wise investment because it'll begin to pay them back on the utility bills and they'll be more comfortable. Okay? And their house, no matter how small it may be, is their castle. Okay? So you might be surprised at who will do it and who won't. These were just some prices in our price book, but you know, these GNs are general replacement. Uh, well, excuse me, those are numbers. We'll have factory, and then these up here that don't say factory are general replacement motors. But notice the difference between a factory motor and a general replacement motor, okay? uh, as far as the same size. Uh, here's a third horsepower 1075 general replacement. This is uh, this was overtime. We never really charged that. Uh, 280, uh, 376. No, excuse me. This was normal price. This was uh, uh, our. Uh, I'm not sure on that one. This was overtime, and this was the cost that our contract customers got. I can't remember what this one was. But then third horsepower condenser fan, same thing, it's $101 maybe one. Part of that $101 though was going to get me. The one the general replacement I have on my truck. So it's more labor. For a dual value capacitor and that quarter horsepower motor this day was ninety nine dollars Yeah. But I got parts of labor in that right. and I'm gonna warranty for two years. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you guys will probably fight it more than I did because that information is so readily available right on the internet. And they're going to look up a family and go, it would only cost me $65. Yes, sir. And I'm more than happy to just charge it for the labor and leave and you know, go get your motor and put it on. I don't know how to put it on. No? Okay. Well, that's parts and labor, and that's a two-year parts and labor warranty. But that's the total price. And we did flat rate for residential. Everybody paid the same price. Now, if I went to uh, Jerry's today, I might get his fan motor changed in 30 minutes, but Randy's taking me an hour because of the different branding equipment. But you both pay $280 to have the fan motor replaced. So that's where it's kind of fair. Okay? Because if I'm a rookie and we're charging parts in labor, a journeyman, a good journeyman might have done his in 20 minutes and his in 45 minutes, but now I got that additional labor. So, uh, you know, if I did uh, Jerry's, it might be just as expensive as a good journeyman doing mittens. You know, but under flat rate, everybody pays the same price. A lot of your uh, car dealerships and stuff like that have done a flat rate. A certain thing, it's just a certain amount of hours, and there's a certain price to change it regardless of which model you got. Yeah, I wasn't questioning before. I didn't know what you 
said people would get on their smartphone and say, oh yeah, they ripped me off. Yep, and you'll have to explain that. And you might, you know, there was one company that's now hiring students. They send their guys off for a whole week training, eight hours a day, just how to handle customers, how to talk to customers, how to handle a customer that's upset about a deal and all that stuff. And I'm sure that's one of the things they talk to. This is how you should handle it when somebody has done that. After a customer's approval, the motor can be removed or replaced. One of the first steps is to mark the position of the fan blade in the orifice. Here is that one that was mounted up against the thing, butt up or lead in, and the shaft was down. I've now turned it around, and I've found me a place on this mount, and I mark where I'm going to measure it. Now, notice I'm using a tape measure here. Usually what I did is I had this big old screwdriver that I used for everything but a screwdriver. It's my pry bar, it's my chisel. I hardly ever use it as a screwdriver. And a lot of times I laid it down to remind me of things. So when I picked it up, oh yeah, did I get my jumper wire? Oh yeah, did I do this? Because I didn't use it much for actual tool. So I would use it. It had marks all over it. But they'd rub off because it was just a mark a lot, a marking. But I would mark a spot that I put that screwdriver down, the tip of it. Then I'd bring this fan blade, and I'd go, okay, this is the fan blade I referenced. I'd put a mark on this fan blade. And then I'd mark where it was and mark my screwdriver instead of bringing out a tape measure every single time. Because I didn't carry a tape measure on my tool pouch because it always got knocked off. Is that conduit that's running from the fan motor out? Usually it's just plastic. Right. And feeding those wires to the rear is kind of a pain. That's just the way they done it. That's the way they did this one. This was an old unit, an old Frederick. But yeah, most of them is just a plastic PVC tube. You know, you've got to feed those wires through there. It's kind of a pain. And there's some that have a channel with little rings that metal screws back up and trying to get four wires where three went. It's pretty tough. But we know how to do that. If we've got a four lead motor, one's an extra wire. Couldn't I cut it off and tape it off at the very end and then just use the three wires? Yeah. So, but I've had guys call me before and go, I can't get all these four wires in there. Well, cut the extra one off. You mean the white one? No! <laughs> the extra one, you know. They're measuring it, a reference somewhere. Um, I've got an inch at this spot from it to the orifice, and I mark where I took that measurement in the orifice and which fan blade I used. Here, this one's mounted shaft up. I'm taking a measure. Now, what I always did here is I laid my marker on the top of that fan blade and just moved it, and it made a mark inside the orifice. Then when I put my new fan motor in, get it mounted, put my fan blade over it, lay my marker back up and move it and make a new mark. If it's a quarter of an inch low, I need to raise the fan blade up. If it's right on, you know what I mean? So I didn't usually use a tape measure. Um, yeah, I've gone over, but I'm almost done. The next step is to thoroughly clean the shaft. The rest. Do not attempt to pull this thing without cleaning the shaft first. Because even if you get it to move, you'll get it stuck. And then you'll never get the, the fan blade off. Now, there, through experience, you'll learn when a shaft looks so bad that it's not worth trying to fix or, or remove the fan blade. And in that case, it'd be better to just price a new fan and fan blade and go get both of them. Okay? Uh, when they're all pitted and nasty. But when they have set screws like this, I can always break those loose. When they're the Allen head, if they're all rusty in the uh, debris, I usually price the fan blade so the customer here's the worst case scenario. If I can break that loose and get the fan blade off, then this is all it's going to cost. But I don't know. But I already pre prepared them for worst case scenario. I'll let you see this again. Okay, good. You bet. Good. So, uh, but the Allens, a lot of times when they're rusted, when you try to break them loose, then they just round off. You couldn't get them out. And, uh, Can you use the puller on that? Yes, and in fact, we'll show that here in a minute. But most of them, I don't need a tool. If I've taken the time, it's not a real long time, but a time to clean the shaft, I won't need a puller in most cases.